Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Bill Roby. I'm a government relations specialist with NHF, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, today to the 2020 Bleeding Disorders Conference, 30th, our plenary session, the 30th anniversary of the Ryan White Care Act. Uh, a few housekeeping items. First of all, please use the chat box to write in any questions or comments and take the time to introduce yourself to everybody. Um, this particular session is live, so the speakers will not be able to see the chat questions. We'll be relaying questions to them, but please uh, take the time to enter your questions there. Um, you can also uh, submit email questions for a later response, or if you have a question you don't feel comfortable asking in the chat box, please enter it and ask a follow-up question box, and we'll respond at a later time. Also, when you receive your evaluation forms tomorrow, please take the opportunity uh, to fill those out. Um, all of our presentations are recorded uh, and will be available to watch online. Now, uh, briefly, again, some disclosures for our speakers. I will go through here with we'll speaker Dana Francis and Dr. Craig Kessler. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Nathan Schaefer, who's our moderator today. So good evening to those on the East Coast and good afternoon to those on the West Coast and aloha to anyone dialing in from Hawaii, in which case we're very jealous. Um, I'm really excited to get our panel underway and I'm joined by three um, esteemed colleagues who are no stranger to the community. We've got Jeannie White Ginder, the mother of Ryan White. We've got Dana Francis, who's a well-renowned social worker from the San Francisco area, and Dr. Craig Kessler from Washington, DC. So the way we're gonna get things um, started here is I'm gonna ask each of our three panelists to answer two questions. And then we've got a number of additional questions that we've prepared and given thought to, but I wanna make it clear. This session is for the community. So community members, please submit questions so that we can answer the questions that you want us to address during our short time together. So the first question that I'm gonna put out there, and this gives a little bit of context about why we're celebrating the 30 years of this landmark legislation. On August 18th in 1990, with significant bipartisan support, both chambers of Congress passed the Ryan White Comprehensive AIDS Resources Emergency Act, which has, be, has come to be known as the Ryan White Care Act. At the time the bill became law, there were 150,000 cases of HIV and AIDS in the United States and more than 100,000 people had died. It was just at the advent of AZT and some medications to treat HIV. And the question I wanna ask of the panelist, and I think Jeannie's gonna kick us off here, is what was your life like in August of 1999, 1990, what do you remember from that time? And, and how was HIV affecting the bleeding disorders community in 1990? Um, you know, 1990 was a really hard year. Uh, April 8th, I lost my son, Ryan White, to AIDS. Uh, he was one of the first children and first hemophiliacs to come down with AIDS. And I never really ever thought I would lose him. And I used to just always follow Ryan around. And uh, after he died, I thought my life was over. I just, I believed in miracles. I believed in cures. And I thought somehow, some way, my son was going to beat this. And a lot of people, though, had a different idea. There wasn't a lot of aid speakers at the time. And so everybody was wanting people, somebody to speak about AIDS. They wanted to try to educate the public like Ryan was doing. And thanks because of Senator Kennedy and Hatch, I got involved and I started speaking. But um, I was not very much involved with the hemophilia community at the time because during a lawsuit that we filed on behalf of Ryan to try to get to, school, get to go to school, um, I contacted the National Hemophilia Foundation and asked to be represented because my biggest nightmare at all was when they told me Ryan White had AIDS because I said, how can my son have AIDS? And they said, well, we think this is the tip of the iceberg. And sure enough, in 85, they started bringing in all hemophiliacs and found out that 80% of them was all HIV infected. 
But what went through my mind, I thought, well, everybody has to have it. I can remember just as soon as he said that my son had AIDS, and I, I thought, everybody has to have it. But I did not find that within the hemophilia community. When I contacted the, them to try to add some kind of support uh, for Ryan to go back to school, because I knew everybody, it was going to affect everybody, and they, uh, that the National Hemophilia said, we're a hemophilia foundation, not an AIDS foundation. We can't draw attention to our hemophiliacs having AIDS. So therefore, I went on alone with the American Foundation for AIDS Research with ANFAR, and I started speaking on behalf of people. Uh, Ryan, one thing about AIDS was Ryan never associated AIDS with gay, IV drug user, hemophilia, or anything. He always said, Mom, once you have AIDS, you're just like everybody else who has AIDS. You're fighting to stay alive. So I just took it on Ryan, and not that I felt like I could ever, ever compare to Ryan, but I wanted to add to his legacy if I could. And so I started speaking and I'm representing people from all around the country and all uh, different ways of co contracting AIDS and just trying to educate the public. Thank you, thank you. And I should have started by saying, we also wanted this session to honor and commemorate Ryan and his legacy, what he's done, not only for the bleeding disorders community, but the entire populace of the United States. What a hero, and um, I can't believe it's been 30 years. So Dr. Kessler, I think the question is next for you, which is the same. What was happening in 1990? How was HIV affecting the bleeding disorders community? And what was life like at the time? Thank you very much for letting me participate in this uh, session at uh, the NHF. Uh, I've been a hemophilia treater for 40 years. And when I uh, was uh, the director of my hemophilia treatment center in Washington, DC, in 1990, I, at that point of my career, uh, I had a lot of questions as to whether or not I'd even be able to remain in hemophilia. Uh, around me were these vibrant, in, uh, wonderful men, and uh, both older and younger individuals who were beginning to develop the manifestations of HIV that uh, we were hoping would not ever affect our population. There was a lot of concern at the time as to whether or not HIV in the hemophilia population was going to be different than the HIV in the gay or IV drug abuser population. And we were hoping that it was going to be different and that it wasn't going to be uh, associated with such high levels of morbidity and mortality. Unfortunately, it turned out that uh, the hemophilia population was probably even harder hit than much of the gay population because they had co-infection with both HIV and HCV at the time. Now, what bothered us at the time was that there was a lot of friction between the hemophilia population and the advocates for the hemophilia population and the advocates for the gay population who had AIDS. And our, our uh, patients did not want to be associated uh, as a generic form of AIDS by being lumped in as uh, whether or not, as a, as a man used to say, I'm always asked when I have HIV, am I hemo or homo? That was what mm -hmm. they were always concerned about. They did not want to be associated with the HIV associated with uh, the gay population. On the other hand, we as physicians realized that we needed to be in some way associated with the gay advocacy groups because all of the clinical research with all of the new antiretrovirals were being conducted on the gay population and all of those studies excluded 
the hemophilia population. <clears throat> so probably one of the, the most uh, important aspects of what came out of the, uh, of the 90s is that we were able to convince the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, to actually open up a blood division that would be focused on the transmission of blood-related organisms to our patient population. And it was in the 90s, right around the time that the Ryan White Act was uh, approved by Congress, that there was also money put into the CDC to help the hemophilia treatment centers enhance their care of our patients with social workers and the other aspects of total care for hemophilia besides just their, their joint disease and their bleeding aspects. That was an extremely important time. But even after that, there was a lot of friction. And just as an example of the friction that was occurring at that time, we did not have recombinant clotting factors at that time. All of the clotting factor concentrates were plasma derived, and they were derived from tens of thousands of donors into a pool of uh, collected plasmas and then purified into factor eight or factor nine concentrate. Well, at the time, the gay population did not want to be questioned and have to answer questionnaires when they went to donate blood and uh, have HIV testing. We, as at the, N at the NHF, I remember, advocated that that was not good for our population because at the time the testing wasn't so perfect that it would exclude all vulnerable individuals to contribute virus into the pool of plasma that hemophilia patients would eventually be receiving. So there was a lot of friction at the time as to uh, uh, how to handle our relationship between the larger gay population that was getting all of the research attention and the hemophilia population that was begging to be included in clinical trials to treat our patients with antiretrovirals. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad you alluded to some of the stigma that was prevalent at the time, which is going to be something we're going to talk about with the next question. But first, I wanted to give Dana the opportunity to also respond to what your experience was like in 1990, please. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here today. Um, in the summer of 1990, I had been a social worker slash health educator for about 18 months with a group called the Hemophilia Council of California. And it, I was not working at a treatment center yet, and I w wouldn't be for another 10 years. But we were a state-funded organization that um, was uh, charged with the work of trying to work in tandem with the treatment centers to help provide as much uh, service on a mental health level and a, an educating level to the larger community about what the issues were for people with bleeding disorders and HIV. So for instance, we would go talk to public health departments, we would talk to dentists, we would talk to school nurses, we would talk to emergency room staff about what hemophilia was and the fact that people with hemophilia were getting HIV and hepatitis C. Um, so we did a lot of educational work and then in tandem with the treatment center staff, um, I just remember, uh, and this was before HIPAA got a little bit tighter like it is now, but sometimes there were patients out in rural areas that maybe the nurse coordinator or even the physician or the social worker was trying to bring in for care or communicate with and the person was partly for some of the reasons we're talking about around um, stigma and homophobia not really wanting to come into the treatment center and part of my job was to get in my car and go with the blessing of the treatment center and go visit that patient and sit and talk to them for a while. The other thing that I did at the time, just because it seemed like the right thing to do, was I started a couple of men's support groups that were focused on HIV, uh, folks who had HIV, and ended up having two of those groups that ran 
in different parts of the Bay Area every month for about 10 years. And it ended up being grief groups as well as support groups, unfortunately, because a lot of the guys who started in 89 and 90 were not there by the time I left in 2000. So. Thank you, Dana. Sure. So the next question I wanted to ask, and again, this is for all three of you, so whoever wants to go first, please feel free. But it's about the parallels of the early days of the HIV epidemic and what our country's experiencing now with COVID-19, because there's definitely still stigma associated with testing. People have mixed emotions about seeing one another walking down the sidewalk with masks on. And I'm just thinking about what I saw on the news a few weeks ago about Dr. Anthony Fauci testifying to a Senate committee. And he even said in his opening remarks that he remembered the day that he first went to the Senate to give testimony about the HIV epidemic. So the question for each of you is, what are the parallels and possibly lessons learned that you think we could take from the early days of the HIV crisis to what we're going through with the current pandemic? Maybe I'll answer from the medical perspective first and then let Jeannie answer from the personal perspective. Uh, you know, it, it always bothers me to see history repeat itself. Uh, and there are, there are definite parallels. I was taking care of, of HIV patients, as I indicated before, uh, 30, 30 years ago. And what was so difficult at that time was the politicization of the care of uh, individuals who had AIDS. Uh, anybody who had AIDS was considered to be an inferior human being compared to the rest of the population. And at that time, before uh, uh, Congress uh, realized that this was uh, only a politically important issue that they had to deal with, they were sidelining individuals who had HIV infections. Uh, research money was not there. Most of the research, early research money was privately collected. It was not publicly collected through the government. Uh, uh, patients were ostracized in schools. Uh, and what was maybe better at that time than is now is that eventually the CDC got extra funding at least in the hemophilia realm, to allow the hemophilia population to sort of be the canaries in the mine shaft uh, for the rest of the total population. I mean, that was, the, that was the philosophy that we used when we were trying to get extra money for uh, research in hemophilia, it was that we said that if there was ever going to be another virus that contaminated the blood supply in the United States, that the hemophilia population would be the most vulnerable population, and that we needed constant surveillance, public health surveillance, in order to be able to pick up bloodborne infections early on. And that's how the CDC got funded. It's unfortunate that since that time, public health has been relatively underfunded and ignored. The CDC is now sidelined uh, somewhat in the COVID situation, and here we are paying the consequences of having an inferior public health system to be able to monitor uh, viral diseases. Uh, the physicians then are just as dedicated as they are now. And it's wonderful to see how many physicians are working 24 seven with patients who have COVID the same way that we were working 24 seven with our hemophilia patients who had uh, symptomatic AIDS and were dying in the hospital. So um, Jeannie, what would you say about the early days of HIV and how we can learn from that today? Uh, you know, it's, it's strange we have Fauci and Fauci was back then and Fauci is now. And listening to medical facts, I think the scientists and I, you know, it was in disarray back then, it's confusion. And I remember everybody thinking you could get AIDS from kissing tears, sweat and saliva, and that you had to do something bad or wrong. That 
somehow, some way, funny things have been going on in our household. That's how he really got AIDS. And so just trying to explain to people and people listening to getting people to listen. And I think that's why Ryan was so good at educating people because he could do it with a smile. I think now we don't have that leader that we need so much in listening to the medical facts. I think that is so important. And for us all, think this is as a health crisis and let's try to do something about it instead of blaming people or um, it's just being so confused, I think. We need one voice. And I, to me, that is Fauci because I've known Fauci ever since this thing started with the AIDS epidemic. And I think we, we really need to educate people. Thank you. Um, Dana, what are your thoughts? Um, about four years ago, our treatment center uh, did a, a screening of the documentary Bad Blood, which I know a lot of folks who are watching this have seen. It's very well done about what happened with hemophilia and HIV and AIDS in the 80s and 90s. And we were lucky enough to have um, Donald Francis, from, who was at the CDC back in the day, and uh, Paul Volberding, Dr. Paul Volberding, who was on the front lines of treating uh, AIDS in San Francisco in the 80s. And what struck me, they sat through the film and then we asked them for their comment before we opened it up to the audience questions. And they both said something similar, which was chilling to me. They said, human nature dictates that when something like this comes, people are in denial at first. And I think Dr. Kessler was referring to that a few minutes ago about here we are again, and we've been through this, but what did we learn? And I, I remember thinking, and Volberding uh, said, I equate it to global warming in terms of people's response. They kind of know there's some science out there and there's some things happening, but um, it's really not gonna be that bad and it's not gonna happen. And here we are, you know, 40 years later, and it's happening. The thing that concerns me as a social worker is the PTSD in our community, and I'm sure in the gay community too, of like, oh my God, you know, we're, we're right back where we were again. And, and a lot of those old scared feelings coming up and horrible feelings for families who lost people and, and the guys who are still alive and their families thinking, oh man, we've been here before, and this is really difficult. So I, um, one thing I've done, which is very, very minor and geographically located, but I, I had been still doing this one men's group for every other month for the last 12 or 13 years. And a few months ago, I said to the guys, would you guys like to do this a little more often right now? Because th there's a lot of stress out there um, for a lot of reasons. And and they all said, yeah, let's do that. So we're doing it on Zoom, and we're doing it every other week instead of every other month. And we've been getting, you know, seven or eight guys to come, and they're different people each week sometimes. And so just trying to, you know, pay attention to what's happening out there and trying to meet the need a little bit in my corner of the world. Thank you, Dana. So. I have um, one more question about the current COVID-19 epidemic, and then we can go back to talking about the legislation. And this one is for you, Dr. Kessler. The first um, cases of HIV were reported to the CDC in June of 1981. And we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. And there's all this concern and desire and attention on the need for a vaccine to help us combat the coronavirus. Can you please explain in layman's terms why vaccine development is so difficult? That's a loaded question. Uh, I'm sorry. Nathan. And, and I, think the, I think the issue is, is that when we think of vaccines, we think of the very popular and the successful vaccines, the rubella, the mumps, uh, the uh, measles, uh, the influenza vaccines, uh, and, uh, and, the, the, and now the COVID uh, vaccine. Now the question is, is that whenever you are trying to develop a vaccine, you're depending on the individual's own immune system to respond to 
a portion of the virus or a dead-like virus or even live virus. I mean, some viruses are live as well. And you're depending on the body to be able to react to that vaccine as if they actually had the disease itself. And so one of the big problems that we see with HIV is that that virus doesn't seem to turn on the immune system quite as robustly as, say, a, a virus from measles, mumps, or even the influenza virus. In addition to that, it's very difficult for the antibodies produced by some of the uh, retroviral viruses to actually be able to be durable. So you may have a, a, an antibody response right after you have the, the vaccination, but those antibodies disappear over a month's period of time, and then you're susceptible to the disease again. We're beginning to see the same kind of questions arise in the development of the COVID vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. We see that uh, we now have any different uh, approaches to the production of either the virus or a portion of the virus that attacks the human immune system. And we're now seeing uh, any number of clinical trials where these are being injected to see whether or not the individual's immune system will pick up the viral particles or the virus itself, respond and make a durable antibody response. We don't really have an answer to this as yet. I think, unfortunately, I don't think that we're going to come up with a COVID vaccine, which is any more successful than the influenza vaccine, which is around 50% successful. And I think that because of that, one of the things that in the COVID infection, just maybe uh, as with the HIV infection, maybe what we have to do is look more at ways of passive immunity rather than active immunity. That is giving hyperimmune globulin collected from patients who have already been infected and use those as ways of, of uh, trying to ameliorate any kind of, of infection that you get from the uh, virus or prevention of the development of any of the, of the symptoms of the virus. It's a very complicated history. And the issue is, is that not all viruses attack the immune system in the same way. Now you've heard Dr. Fauci talk recently about what we should be really looking at instead of B cell immunity is T cell immunity. And that goes back to HIV. HIV is really a T cell mediated virus. COVID looks like it may be a T cell mediated virus. And because of that, our success at developing a vaccine may be equally unsuccessful as it is with HIV. I hope it isn't, but right now there's much more hope and hype than there are data. So, thank you. Um, I want to um, go back to something that you alluded to, Jeannie, in your initial remarks about what happened in 1990 that led to the naming of the legislation after your son. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that the Ryan White Care Act um, helps people with HIV, not just people with HIV and bleeding disorders. And there's about 1.2 million people that live with HIV um, in the United States and a much smaller of those folks who actually have hemophilia. But Jeannie, for folks who are listening in, can you please explain how the legislation came to be named after your son and what that decision was like? Well, um, in the week of April uh, was a horrible time. Um, it was about a week and a half before Ryan died and Elton John, who was a friend, a friend of the family, had come to help with the media and all the visitors and just, it was very chaotic. chaotic. They put Ryan on a ventilator um, on life support, so to speak, and they put him in a coma, really, and um, hoping the drugs would work. And Elton was taking all the messages, and there was a message that came through the switchboard at the hospital, at Riley Hospital, 
and it was Senator Kennedy. And Senator Kennedy, uh, Elton talked to Senator Kennedy, and Elton came to me and he said, Jeannie, this is a call I think you should take. So I got on the phone and it was Senator Kennedy, and he said that um, they were having these first hearings on a Comprehensive AIDS Resource Act, and he said, nobody has brought so much attention to this disease. For the first time, we have people caring about people with AIDS now. He said, with your permission, we would like to name it the Ryan White Care Act. And at the time, I mean, I was so concerned about my son. All I can remember just saying, well, that would be nice. Never ever realizing how enormous that bill would become. And then when I lost Ryan, it was just a couple weeks after Ryan passed away, I get another call from Senator Kennedy wanting me to come to DC. And I said, oh no, Ryan did that, not me. He said, no, we really need your voice. He said, well, AIDS is so fresh on everybody's minds and at Ryan's passing. He said, Ryan brought so much attention to, to this disease. And he said, please, will you come to DC? And I said, really, I can't. I said, I know nothing about the government. I said, I'm not smart enough. And he said, we have people that know about the bill. You just be a mom. I still kept saying no. Finally, my friends from Ampar called me and they said, do this for us. Do this for us living with AIDS today. And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm afraid I would hurt the cause more than help the cause. And Terry Byrne, he said, no, please do this for us. And I still, he said, we know about the bill. You just, you know, be a mom. And finally, I got a call from Senator Hatch. And he was the really one that really gave me the confidence to do it. He said, I'm not going to take no for an answer. He said, I have 25 senators lined up for you. All we want you to do is be a mom. We're going to approach this disease a little differently. Everybody has a mom. And we want you to share our story, your story of how Ryan lived and died from AIDS. And he said, uh, you know, we'll have people support you. And I did. I went to D.C. and I didn't really feel like I did that great. I just, I just felt like I was just telling my story of, you know, a mom that was, you know, overcome with grief and, and all that. But um, the bill passed unanimously almost and bipartisan. And you don't have that uh, very much anymore between the House and the Senate. And, but it, the bill passed on August the 18th and it's been continuing every, every, every year since, every four years we reauthorize it or else we just continue it. So, I mean, I, I don't know. It's been a longevity and I could not be more proud of Ryan's legacy and because of the Ryan White Care Act. Uh, thank you, Jeannie. I, I think that that's really powerful for a few reasons. One, this is the same thing we tell families who've never come to Washington days before. You're not there to be an expert in healthcare. You're not there to be an expert in how a bill becomes a law. You're there to share your story. It is your elected officials responsibility to translate your story into policy solutions. So you should go and be a mom and share your passion and they will figure out what that means um, at the end of the day for policy solutions. Jeannie, I have a follow-up question for you and this is one that came through the chat and everyone who's listening in, please keep in mind, we wanna hear your questions, so please submit them. Um, but Jeannie, it's been 30 years since the passage of the Ryan White Care Act and you're still an active advocate and I know you're still very engaged with the broader HIV and AIDS community and those advocates. So what keeps you going? Uh, to see a cure for AIDS, I think. Um, I saw so many people die and people who got us to where we are today. People from AMFAR, people who uh, did all the work. I mean, Ryan's name is on the bill, but the people that actually did all the work most people will not know their names or see their faces and know who they are, but I do. I work with them. And to see all the dedication that people went through, all the medical people, all the people, I mean, people don't realize how hard it is to get something passed and you know, how hard it is. Everybody is, is just wants, I think everybody just wants to put blame and everything, but there is a lot of work that goes into getting something passed. And just to know that I knew some of them people uh, that made such a difference. And it was like, just while I'm alive, I can maybe still do something for them uh, until we have a cure for this disease. 
The other thing that you brought up that I just want to reiterate is that the two champions of the bill initially were Senators Kennedy from Massachusetts and Hatch from Utah. Mm -hmm. Those are strange bedfellows. Those are not people who share a lot in terms of their politics. But the HIV crisis and the way it affected the bleeding disorders community transcended politics. And it passed with such significant support that I just think it speaks volumes to the way that the legislation was advanced and the ways that they um, approached you and wanted to utilize your voice and your family. So um, the next question, Dana, is for you. And this um, pertains to something that we experience often at our annual conference when we typically are able to get together. We always have a memorial session. And sometimes we hear from new families that they don't really want to hear about the HIV crisis. And then we hear from many others who have personal experience who say, no, it's absolutely essential that we do continue to rem remind ourselves what the HIV crisis meant for the community. And my question is about your experience being in San Francisco and the AIDS Memorial Grove, because they recently dedicated a specific section to the hemophilia community. For those who are listening in who haven't been there, what is the experience like and what do you think is the significance of that portion of the Grove specifically? It's very powerful to go there. It's a beautiful area in Golden Gate Park where we can see the park from my office actually up on the hill in San Francisco. And, you know, thinking about this, I, I think one way to kind of uh, conceptualize it is to think about the enormous impact of the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, mm. D.C. And you see, if you haven't been there, you know, you've seen pictures of family members and other guys who survived the war going up to the wall and touching the names and leaving things and having a lot of emotions. And this is what I think the hemophilia circle has provided for the bleeding disorders community. There's a larger circle of names in, in the actual grove of redwood trees, and most of the names in that circle are people, gay people who had AIDS and died. And there's, I don't know how many names, but the circle's getting so big now that they, they're running out of places to engrave. Um, about four years ago, uh, John Cunningham, who's the executive director of the, what they're calling now the National AIDS Memorial, I think they've kind of let the word grove out, um, came to our, uh, a team meeting of our uh, treatment center team with a couple of his colleagues and took like 20 minutes of our meeting time and just explained to us that he... Uh, wanted to talk with people in the bleeding disorders community about maybe building something for our community that was similar in terms of that powerful emotional connection. And that was like the, the beginning of the talks and it, over the next couple of years, working with NHF, with HFA, with COT, with different groups that had uh, um, represented the hemophilia community, they raised the money. They came up with the, um, the idea. It's not in the trees. There's a, outside of that grove, there's a large meadow. It's very nice. And up on the slope, they hired landscapers to level it off, to build a beautiful bench. And you can walk up these ramped walkways so people in wheelchairs can get up there. Guys with crutches can get up there easily. There are no stairs to get up there, I don't believe. And... It's just this beautiful spot in the park, very private. Um, and I'll just say, the first time I went, um, I went with a friend who was visiting from Australia, and we stood there for an hour. And I, I couldn't help but tell some stories about the names of guys that I knew. Some were from the Bay Area, some were from other parts of the country. Um, but just about how they're struggles in their lives and their uh, bravery had affected my life and my career. So 
it's a it's a very emotional place. It's a it's hard in some ways, but it's very healing too. I think, and I think that's exactly the reason why they wanted to do this was to give play, people a place to go to heal. So, so for anyone who hasn't been, we strongly encourage you to go. Um, it is a very powerful um, and meaningful experience. So my next question is for Dr. Kessler, and it's about what it's like to live with both HIV and hemophilia. And I ask it because of a couple of reasons. One, a lot of folks think now with HIV, you can take medication, you can be undetectable and live a very healthy lifestyle. And with hemophilia, there's so many products that are out there now, there oftentimes is this misconception that you can live a completely normal life, that it's entirely different than it was 30 years ago. So the question, which is a two-part one, um, and so bear with me, and I don't mean to give you all these difficult questions, but what was it like to live with HIV and hemophilia in 1990, and what would the prognosis B, if someone with hemophilia contracted HIV in 2020? Well, Nathan, uh, in 1990, I don't think that we really had any idea of how effective the antiretrovirals were going to be. We knew that uh, we could suppress the uh, HIV viral uh, titers down to undetectable levels. But we didn't know at that point whether our, our uh, individuals with hemophilia who had been pre-infected by uh, HCV and hepatitis B, how the two diseases would blend into each other. And so we've, been, we've learned through the years that we're very successful at reducing and eliminating the hepatitis uh, C uh, and hepatitis B. We had no way of doing that back in the 90s. And so we were losing patients who were, hep who were HIV undetectable viral titer. We were losing them to end-stage liver disease. Now we have the ability to suppress both the hepatitis viruses and HIV and those individuals are leading very, very successful and productive lives. Added to that is the fact that we are screening uh, patients very carefully these days for any hepatocellular carcinoma, which can still arise from chronic hepatitis infection. And we can do a lot of things with the patients who develop hepatocellular carcinoma including liver transplants, uh, emboliz chemoembolization, and oral medications. So hemophilia today is extremely different from what it was in the 90s. But I have to tell you, as an individual physician who's been in both uh, the bleak times of hemophilia and now the, the brighter days of hemophilia, I still think every time a new drug comes out, I am still extremely careful, thoughtful about making certain that I don't make a mistake like I may have made back in the 80s when I was so focused on thinking that the hemophilia individual's biggest problem was death by bleed rather than death by AIDS. And even when you take a look now, back uh, retrospectively, at the hemophilia population, in the days of HIV, before the retrovirals were shown to be effective, the major death uh, etiology was bleeding at that time. It, bleeding still outweighed the, uh, the death by HIV. In the 90s, in the late 90s, uh, as the antiretrovirals were coming into being, but hemophilia patients were having difficulty getting them. At that time, HIV superseded bleeding as a cause of death in young men. So here we are in 2020, 
And what is the most common cause of death in our patients? It's still bleeding. And so here we are. We've got the tools to be able to stop bleeding, but not the perfect tools. And I think that uh, it's much better now than it was before. Many of our young patients don't even know what it's like to have a bleed because of prophylaxis. Many of our young patients think of uh, AIDS in the hemophilia population as a historical uh, anachronism that they'll never experience. But I, as a physician, still worry that at some point there's going to be another problem that occurs, whether it's um, an unforeseen uh, problem with genetically engineered products or a problem associated with gene therapy or a problem associated with our other uh, uh, modalities to treatment, I am still petrified by make, that I may make a mistake that's going to harm our patients. Thank you. So we've got a question in the chat, and I'm going to do my best to answer some of it. And then, Dana, I'm going to ask you if you've got additional thoughts. But the question is, how do states and cities use Ryan White Care Act dollars? What kind of services does it go for? The Ryan White Care Act is incredibly complex. It's basically broken down into four main parts. They used to be called titles, but they changed that in 2016, 2006. Part one goes to cities where there is a disproportionate rate of HIV infection. There has long been a recognition, it's then now commonly called community viral load, a recognition that if you've got a concentrated case of HIV infections, you need to have more aggressive interventions. The second and the largest part of the Ryan White Care Act is a um, function that goes directly to the states, and it primarily funds access to drugs. It's called the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, or ADAP. That's over 50% of the overall budget of the Ryan White program on an annual appropriations basis, which we could get into that if, if we have more time. Um, and Part C and Part D are a little bit different, and I don't need to go into that in the interest of time. But I guess the question, Dana, if you could help me answer, what else can Ryan White dollars do to support patients beyond just getting to see their doctor and getting their medication? Um, a couple of things, and I'm sure there are way more than just a couple of things, but I did a little bit of a survey among some of my colleagues around the country, and the, the, the things that popped to the top were um, Ryan White funds have helped our patients get dental care. It's helped pay for that. It, they, the funds have helped people get mental health care. Um, I don't know how widely it's been utilized. But money is there, and in each um, either municipality or state, uh, organizations apply for some of that money to provide those services, and then the patients, both in the gay community and in the bleeding disorders community, need to access that. So um, you would you would have to um, you know find out who's who got these grants, who's offering the services, and then you'd have to go and. Um, make appointments and try to do that. Um, let me think. Uh, other just uh, HIV-related services, um, maybe uh, seeing a physician. Because the, the thing that's important, and I think you've alluded to this, Nathan, that the funding was made available to improve access to care for low-income, uninsured, and underinsured people affect affected by HIV and AIDS. So if you're working and you're able to still work and you've got private insurance, you go wherever you want to go. This money that is named after Jeannie's son, Ryan, really came out to help people because they were sick, they'd lost their jobs, they did not have good insurance coverage anymore, and they desperately needed some of these um, services and they couldn't afford them. And so uh, I think organizations have tried really hard to kind of look at what people need and then um, make some of those services available. And then our community has to 
with the help of social workers and doctors and nurses interface and find access so that they can get the, the services that they need. A number of treatment centers have um, sent their patients, hemophilia patients, to dentists who are part of this program so they can get their dental care and it won't cost them. No, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned dental. That's a big part of part F of the program is specialized um, dental care and did get a text from a colleague to remind everybody about dental care. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, another big one is nutrition. And that goes toward um, not only providing healthy meals, but providing nutrition um, counseling or, or guidance where you can actually meet with an expert and um, talk about what you eat on a daily basis and how you could be healthier and how you can get access to better, more sustaining food for you and your family. So um, it looks like we've lost Dr. Kessler, hopefully just uh, temporarily. So hopefully he'll um, come back around. But I do have another question for um, at least the both of you. Now, Jeannie mentioned um, reauthorization of the Ryan White Care Act. And I just want to succinctly explain what that means. Uh, the Ryan White Care Act is a discretionary health care program. That means it is subject to annual appropriations of Congress putting in a specific amount of dollars. Unlike Medicaid and Medicare that are entitlement programs, and the easiest way that I can explain this, explain this is that with entitlement programs, if you bake a pie and you eat all of the pie, the federal government will have to make more pie. If it's a discretionary healthcare program and you've got a whole pie and you divvy it all up, the pie is gone. So they will not make more pie unless they allocate additional resources. The reason I bring all of that up is because you have to, as an advocate for the Ryan White Care Act, fight for um, adequate federal appropriations, but you also have to advocate for policy changes that inform what the next iteration of the Ryan White Care Act will look like. When I started my career, this was one of the first things I did, which was one of the earlier versions of the Ryan White Care Act, and I won't tell you which year because then I'll date myself. In any event, the point is that in order to make the program fit the needs of the current um, epidemiology of HIV in the United States, and in order to get an adequate amount of resources, advocates have to remain incredibly vigilant and engaged in order to successfully get the needs of their community met. So that's a roundabout way of asking this question. Why is it so important for advocates to remain engaged and connected with their elected officials, even if they're not in the middle of an epidemic? Why is it so important for our full community to remain as engaged as possible with advocacy opportunities? Anyone? Well, I, I think it's to keep it real. They need to see the real faces. I think it, that you get dormant. I mean, you know, they mm -hmm. go on to something else. We have to keep whatever our issues are, we have to keep it in front of, you know, the politicians. We have to keep it in, 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 in the media if we can. But we have to have a voice. And I think that, you know, if without the voice, then people lose interest. So I think by definitely, you know, speaking up and acting out and uh, it's the same way with hemophilia, whether it's AIDS, you know, I think that's why, like you said, on the Hill, it's important to, to, to keep the, the faces of the real people that it's affecting. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to just reference something Dr. Kessler said a while ago about how this, he worries that something like this could happen again. And um, none of us want that to happen, but I agree with him. I think it could. And this is why um, even when the families with young kids say, I don't want to, I don't want to go to that service or it's uncomfortable for me to think about what happened to the community all those years ago, I don't want them to get depressed about it either. But the fact is that it happened. And to Dr. Kessler's point, it could happen again. And it's thankless work to do the advocacy in Washington and in your state capitals, but 
it's really important never to forget what happened. The, the canary in the coal mine and all that. We were it. We were the we were the ones who got the bad blood and um, had to kind of suffer through all of this. And one way to maybe help getting a jump on it if it does happen again is to not not get lazy and not get complacent about our advocacy work. So, yeah. Nathan, I'd like to follow on a little bit as well. Please. You know, as as great strides as we've made in hemophilia A and hemophilia B, we're still reliant on on blood products, plasma donated blood products for all of the other uh, for most of all of the other rare bleeding disorders. So we have recombinant factor 13, yes. We have, but when you take a look at the other clotting factor deficiencies that are associated with bleeding disorders, including von Willebrand disease, which is much more common than uh, with uh, than hemophilia is, uh, we only have one genetically engineered product for von Willebrand disease. To me, we can celebrate what we've experienced for rare bleeding disorders for hemophilia A and B, but we're far away from celebrating all of our constituents' vulnerabilities uh, with the current blood products that we have available. In addition, going back to why we need to, to be active uh, and, and going up on Capitol Hill all the time, as a physician, I feel that it's my responsibility as a scientist and a healthcare provider to provide reality testing to the Congress. <clears throat> they are uh, not listening to science, even now with the COVID infection. If they would listen to science, if they would listen to public health and listen to what we've learned in the past and what we can prevent in the future, we may be able to avert catastrophes in the future. And every time I go up on Capitol Hill, it's, it's trying to prevent the politicization of science into the total context of public health. And it's quite important for us to continue, just like Dr. Fauci does every night on television, is to contradict the naysayers, contradict the false facts and to make sure that people understand that we're going to overcome these problems only by science, not by emotion or by politics. Thank you. So we're just about out of time, but I want to give each of the panelists an opportunity. If there's any kind of um, final takeaway that you want participants to hear about Ryan or about the legislation or the impact that it's had on our country? Are there any sort of parting remarks that you wanted to share? You know, I, th I think the important thing here uh, about the Ryan White Act is to appreciate what individuals can accomplish for uh, a, large, a larger number of individuals who aren't, uh, uh, aren't, who are not as self-confident, who don't, who are too sick to be their own self-advocates, uh, who don't feel that they can offer as much as other individuals who are articulate. I think it's our responsibility as patients, caregivers, and advocacy groups to continue to fight for what kinds of things that Ryan was trying to achieve. You know, when I go to work and I do clinical, clinical trials with uh, individuals with hemophilia, those individuals are extremely brave. They are allowing themselves to be inoculated, treated with new modalities of treatment. We don't know what's going to happen. They are extremely brave. They are sort of the astronauts of the bleeding disorders population. And I am forever thankful for what they provide 
uh, for their own uh, fellow uh, members of the disease state. I, I'm just so impressed by how altruistic they are when it comes to science. And we, we need to let them know we appreciate everything that they do for the total disease, uh, whether it's the treatment, the, uh, the science, the politics, the advocacy, whatever. Thank you. So um, it looks like we're just about out of time, but I want to um, say a couple of thank yous. Um, first of all, thank you to the three of you for lending your expertise and your knowledge um, and all of your experiences. I especially want to say thank you to Jeannie for um, opening up your family's struggle and your, um, your life with the American people. Um, clearly, we can see that the um, legacy of Ryan continues on and continues to benefit millions of Americans. So we are so thankful to you for um, sharing your story and being a voice of reason um, over, over the years. So um, with that, I will say um, thank you everyone for participating. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your virtual BDC experience. I can't wait for the day when I get to actually see all of you in person. So thank you again for joining and be well. Thank you all.